Buenas tardes, everyone. We're going to get started. Buenas tardes. I'm Carlos Menchaca, chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. Uh, before going any further, I'd like to thank Speaker Cory Johnson for his commitment to our immigrant community and for being here today. And Councilmember Rosenthal, who's next door chairing her own committee uh, for being here today on her resolution to abolish ICE, which I hope will be starting a place for an important conversation for us all. I would also like to recognize the members of the committee who are here and who have joined us, uh, Councilmember Danny Drum, and also co-sponsor of the Abolish ICE resolution uh, from the Lower East Side, Councilmember Carlina Rivera. Today, New York City's Council Committee on Immigration will examine the ways in which the immigration enforcement, namely the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, has failed to protect our public safety. Instead, it has opted to abuse its power to terrorize our communities, including the communities in our very own city. We're gonna hear from families and residents impacted, public servants, public defenders, people who are doing the good work on the ground to defend their rights. I hope that by the end of the hearing today, we will be able to answer the question, what does a city and a nation without ICE look like? Specifically, what does a nation with a more humane and just immigration system look like? The committee will additionally hear one bill and one resolution, intro 1092, uh, sponsored by myself and Councilmember Williams, and then the pre-considered resolution sponsored by Councilmembers Rosenthal, Rivera, and myself. The local law that we're proposing would prohibit the city from entering into revenue contracts with entities engaged in immigration enforcement, entities that enforce provisions of the Immigration and Nationality Act that penalize a person's presence in or entry into or re-entry into the United States. Revenue contracts are contracts where a city provides goods or services in return for a fee. You know, we've been hearing this call for a while now, abolish ICE. It's a hashtag on Twitter, it's a phenomenon, it's a campaign promise, it's a rally cry. In the media and in the campaigns in our communities across the country, people are asking us to abolish ICE. And it resonates for a reason. For too long, this agency represents the worst of our broken system. It exceeds, it exceeds its mandate, it abuses its power, and devastates communities and our families. In this context, we not only have the opportunity to call for its end, we have the opportunity and the obligation to call for its end, but we also have the opportunity to chart the course for a more humane and just immigration enforcement system that recognizes the dignity of all persons. And as the only legislative committee on immigration in the state, this Committee on Immigration is also unparalleled in scope at the congressional level. In light of this, we have a unique responsibility and duty to examine ICE's impact on immigrant communities in New York City and the alternative systems, which could potentially serve not only New Yorkers, but immigrant communities across the country. Today, we will hear from members of the public from academics, from advocates, as well as the mayoral administration who will speak to specific points where ICE, as an enforcement agency that is barely 20 years old, has extended beyond its mandate, acted in roguish ways, undermined its public safety mission, and hampered our city efforts to serve our people while inhibiting our use of taxpayer dollars. In the first eight months of the Trump presidency, we saw a 67% increase in ICE arrests around the city. There was also a 225% increase in ICE arrests of individuals without any criminal history. Since 2017, the stories have poured into our district offices. Family members 
picked up by ICE at our courthouses, routine check-ins with USCIS and ICE, and near-sensitive sites like schools and houses of worship. These have historically been off-limits for ICE. And I want to make it clear that despite these appalling numbers, rogue immigration enforcement precedes the Trump presidency. Rogue, immig in, uh, rogue immigration enforcement under ICE has been a problem since its inception in 2003 when it was established under the newly created Department of Homeland Security as part of the federal government's effort to reorganize its anti-terrorism apparatus post 9-11. Aided by the 1996 law that significantly expanded the list of crimes that allows for deportation of green card holders, ICE executed an increased number of deportations in the decade following 2003. This period is marked by its focus on removal as a bottom line, often regardless of an individual's threat to safety. Although the Obama administration narrowed its focus to those with criminal backgrounds, the administration continued to deport people in record numbers. This is but a brief summary of ICE's history, and some of our testimonies today will go into the history in more detail. But before, oh, I should say, but this brief summary points to a troubling history of mass deportations at the, at the hands of ICE that fundamentally reflects a lack of accountability, a lack of checks and balances. And ICE as a heavily politicized entity that has become the enforcement arm of an anti-immigrant agenda. As a sanctuary city, we have come a long way in providing protections for our immigrant community. In 2014, this city council passed detainer laws that began to untangle city law enforcement from civil immigration enforcement and end ICE's presence on Rikers Island. In 2017, this council passed even more expansive detainer laws to further limit the city's cooperation with ICE, including Local Law 228, which prohibits the use of city resources property, and information obtained on behalf of the city in reference to an immigration enforcement. In addition to laws untangling our cooperation with ICE, the council has also passed legislation to provide free immigration lawyers to all detained immigrants. Today we are hearing a bill that would go further to distangle the city from this immigration enforcement anti-immigrant agenda, making it clear that we do not condone and will not cooperate with ICE's activities. With this legislation, the city of New York will be prohibited from entering into revenue contracts with entities engaged in immigration enforcement. Any of them, whatever they call them, we're not gonna wanna do business with them. This would apply to all contracts where the city provides goods or services to immigrant or immigration enforcement entities for a fee. For example, ICE currently contracts with the City of New York to rent out NYPD firing range facility. We get to decide how to cooperate with immigration enforcement efforts, and we want to further disentangle the city from immigration enforcement to strengthen our status and our commitment that comes every single day when we come to work as city council members to maintain our commitment to Sanctuary City. We are doing this at the city level, but with many things, we need, to, we need the state to act as well. So currently, New York State members of the Assembly and the Senate also want to think about this with us and think about their contracts and their immigration enforcement entities. For example, ICE has a contract with the New York State Department of Motor Vehicles. We call on the state to pass similar legislation and support efforts to end the state contracts with ICE, which is currently being considered, again, by our colleagues in the state. But this fierce leadership is also at the top of this incredible council through the speaker, Corey Johnson, who stands every day arm to arm, hand to hand, with our immigrant communities, and fights like no one else. And I would like him to speak on behalf of the hearing topic and on behalf of the immigrant communities that he represents across the city.
Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Chairman Chaka. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council, and I want to thank, of course, our Chair and Councilmember Carlsman Chaka. Uh, for convening this hearing on such a critical topic of personal importance to so many New Yorkers and for his steadfast, persistent, long-standing advocacy and leadership with immigrant communities across the city and across this country. In July, this committee met to shed light <clears throat> on the nightmare unfolding at our southern border, the aftermath of a family separation policy that led to at least 300 children to New York City where some continue to wait for reunification with their parents and guardians. And that ordeal is not over yet. In fact, yesterday, Medina Torre published an article in Politico that pointed out that approximately 40 children in the city are still separated from their parents and they're under the care of the Federal Office of Refugee Resettlement. They have not been placed with long-term guardians yet. Because of this, they are not enrolled in city schools and educational services are provided to them at the Federal Office of Refugee Resettlement. <clears throat> Today, we are here to have an honest discussion about the insidious acts of a rogue federal agency. For years, ICE has been the primary actor in enforcing immigration law using inhumane policies, such as home and workplace raids, policies that remain ongoing, and that send ripples through our neighborhoods, schools, and houses of worship. If you came to our July 12th hearing, you may remember the Make the Road member named Vivian, who testified about her family's ICE encounter. Her husband of 14 years was detained by ICE at their marriage-based interview in May, and she has had to fight his case from the outside while taking care of their two children, a four-month-old and a two-year-old. It is heartbreaking. I wish I could say that this was the first story that I've heard, but in the first eight months of the Trump presidency, as Chairman Chaka said, ICE arrests have increased by 67% in the New York City area. And we get weekly, sometimes daily, and I know Carlos gets a lot of this, requests for help from individuals across the country and across our city that have encountered ICE pleading for help to keep their families together. These arrests have done nothing to make the city safer. And in fact, it may have had the opposite effect. With every ICE sighting, our neighborhoods erupt into panic. City agencies have seen drops in inquiries for services. Police departments across the nation have noted a decrease in calls related to domestic violence and abuse from Spanish-speaking communities. And children are kept home from school in fear of a potential raid. The Federal Census Bureau currently gearing up for the 2020 census has noted the large number of unsolicited concerns about ICE raised by local residents, even though legally speaking, no census data can be shared with ICE. During the Rhode Island tests earlier this year on the census, we heard reports of entire families moving out after a census worker knocked on their door and asked them to fill out a test census, and they did this out of abject fear. That fear is palpable. The long-term impact is generational trauma. In New York City, a city of immigrants, proudly a city of immigrants, over one million homes are considered mixed households with at least one undocumented member of the household. We are looking at a prolonged public health crisis. Toxic stress levels, especially in children, are directly related to lower health outcomes later in life. The fear is also pushing immigrants further into the shadows, forcing families to make harrowing decisions to forgo medical care or to not to send their children to school or not report crimes to the police. This puts our entire city at risk. This council has made clear steps to set this city apart as a sanctuary city, and we continue that work today by hearing legislation that would further disentangle our city from the cruel immigration enforcement perpetrated by our federal government. I am proud of my brave colleagues, again especially Chair Carlos Menchaca, for broaching this subject and introducing this legislation, and also my good friend, Councilwoman Helen Rosenthal, for her strong statement in support of a congressional act that would establish a humane immigration enforcement system. 
through the pre-considered resolution we will hear today. As I've said before, ICE needs to go. Obviously, I am not calling for an end to national security investigations that keep us safe, like ones that target human trafficking and the drug trade. That's not what this movement is about, despite what critics want to say. That work can and should be done with other federal entities that can do that work. But ICE has become an indiscriminate deportation and detention machine, leaving our communities broken, not safer. And we must hold it accountable for its rogue practices and failure to uphold its mission. I look forward to an informed and meaningful conversation about how abolishing ICE fits into the important larger conversation of comprehensive immigration reform. And I, I lastly uh, want to thank the press. I want to thank the press for telling the daily stories related to these cruel and inhumane policies. I see uh, Philippe de la Hose is here from Documented New York uh, and Medina Torres piece yesterday in Politico and uh, all the other reporters here and reporters who are not here who are covering this crisis on a daily basis in New York City and across the country, shedding light on the human impact, not just the statistics and numbers and philosophy, but around the human impact, the daily trauma that is incurred because of this draconian, autocratic, inhumane, and cruel policy that's being perpetrated on our city and on this country. I look forward to this hearing today. I'm grateful the council remains a leader on this subject, and I believe it is now finally time for us to abolish ICE. Thank you, Chair Vrachaka. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, for your commitment. And there's just no way we get to abolish ICE without that support from you, from the city council, and from the people of this great city. Uh, and we want to hear uh, from Council Member Helen Rosenthal on the resolution. Thank you, Chair Menchaca and Speaker Johnson for your leadership and the opportunity today to introduce this resolution. U.S. Uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, has only existed since 2003. In 15 short years, the agency has racked up an appalling and infamous record of abuses while failing to make this country any safer. On paper, ICE was created to prevent acts of terror. In practice, it has focused mainly on the detention and removal of individual immigrants and done so in an abusive and counterproductive manner. Under this president, ICE has dropped even the pretense of targeting individuals who have committed serious felonies. Instead, opaquely choosing its enforcement targets and, in effect, terrorizing entire communities. ICE has done so through a pattern of abuses of power, undermining the rule of law, and failing to protect those under its jurisdiction. ICE agents have posed as police officers, threatening the critical public safety link between local police and immigrant communities. It has targeted immigrant enforcement against political activists. It has wrongly detained hundreds and hundreds of American citizens, some of whom spent years in detention due to ICE's negligence. We have seen a serious practice of sexual abuse in ICE's detention facilities. From 2013 to 2017, ICE received more than 1,300 complaints of sexual abuse by people it detained, a figure advocates contend is likely significantly underreported. Although ICE itself has, since 2014, been required by law to annually report to the public 
all aggregated sexual abuse and assault data? It has never done so. Reporting by The Intercept found that of 1,224 allegations of abuse reported to the Department of Homeland Security Officer of the Inspector General from 2010 to 2017, just 43 were actually investigated. When faced with evidence of the injustices and abuses perpetrated by ICE, the President and his supporters have engaged in racist and alarmist demagoguery. First, they insist that we must accept these abuses if we wish to be safe. That idea is absurd. And the legislation that this resolution calls on Congress to pass demonstrates that reform does not undermine security. H.R. 6361, the Establishing a Humane Immigration Enforcement System Act, does not mean open borders, nor does it mean an end to all immigration enforcement. What it would mean is the creation of a task force to review the truly essential functions currently under jurisdiction of ICE and transfer them to other federal agencies while eliminating those that fail to serve a public safety or national security purpose. The President's supporters also point to the fact that many of these abuses began under the Bush and Obama administrations, as if that were exculpatory, rather than an even more damning indictment of ICE as an institution. By separating interior immigration enforcement from other law enforcement or national security concerns, it is no surprise that ICE has interpreted its mandate in the cynical and counterproductive way that it has. And shielded from public oversight and accountability, it is no surprise that it has done so in abusive ways. This larger point brings me to why I think this resolution is so important and why hashtag abolish ICE has resonated so profoundly with so many people. It has resonated because of all of the specific reasons we've discussed, because of the cruelty and injustice we've seen in immigration enforcement over the past two years and over the past decade or so. It has also resonated because at its core, it represents a willingness to reshape our institutions, to rectify injustice, and chart a course to a more humane place. This conversation is similar in many ways to the discussion of closing Rikers here in New York City. Yes, there are practical and political challenges. Yes, transforming institutions is complicated work, but it must be done. We must do it. And that is what Abolish ICE represents. It is a rejoinder to the unimaginative pedantry of those who defend the status quo. It means starting with the goal of justice and designing institutions to achieve it, rather than starting with existing institutions and allowing them to limit our conceptions of justice. By passing this resolution, the New York City Council can stand up for our immigrant neighbors, and just as importantly, can stand up for the principle of confronting injustice no matter what. And so I thank my colleagues for their consideration. And of course, I want to thank my legislative director, Sean Fitzpatrick, who was the first to see the necessity of H.R. 6361 and this resolution. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Thank you, Chair Menchaca. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, uh, for, your, for your commitment and looking forward to today's discussion and the ultimate 
abolishing of ICE. Uh, and on that topic too, I want to call Councilmember Rivera to say a few words about the resolution. Thank you, uh, Chairman Chaka, and of course the fellow committee members for allowing me to speak on this pre-considered reso um, that I have proudly introduced with my colleagues. And it has been unfortunate over the past few months how our nation has been witness to some of the most horrifying enforcement actions ever taken in the history of this nation. Actions taken by our federal government against immigrants who came here simply looking for their piece of the American dream. But these kinds of human rights violations sadly aren't a new development. They have been going on for years. Earlier this year, I had to introduce and help pass a resolution in support of the Keep Families Together Act because our current president continues to use his broad immigration powers to rip families apart at our border and violate the most basic decencies that our country values. It's time we listen to the calls of immigration advocates who have been ignored for far too long. We need to swiftly and completely abolish ICE as our resolution being heard today calls for. As mentioned, ICE was established just under two decades ago and since then has been given the blanket directive to break up families and unfairly deport immigrant New Yorkers. This is an abuse of the agency's mission, rips at the moral fabric of our nation and shows that we qu clearly need to replace the agency with a more humane immigration system, one that treats every person with dignity and respect. We had an immigration system that existed for hundreds of years in this country without ICE and we most certainly deserve to have one without this agency again. As representatives of a city that has been the gateway to millions of immigrants and refugees for centuries, we must also rid ourselves of any complicity in this moral failure. While we will continue to fight in Washington to shut down and replace this agency, we must also continue to fight to protect our courts of law, our small businesses, and our community spaces here in the five boroughs from ICE intrusion. If we are going to truly stand by our fellow New Yorkers who have helped nurture and grow our wonderfully diverse city, a so-called sanctuary city, then we must not contract or work in any way with an entity that engages with immigration enforcement as intro 1092 would require. I want to thank my fellow bill sponsors for their tireless advocacy on these important issues, the countless organizations fighting alongside us, and of course, as mentioned by the speaker, the journalists some of whom are in this room or watching at home who have reported on this crisis long before anyone was listening. I call on my colleagues to join us in supporting both of these pieces of legislation, and I want to thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, Councilmember Rivera. And as we continue with the hearing, uh, I want to also say thank you to the incredible investiga investigation uh, from our press that really brought to light the fact that contracts did exist and we want to continue working in partnership with all of you on this very important topic uh, and continued understanding of how we are so entangled with this administration. Um, the, the hearing that we're holding today couldn't have done, been done without incredible staff support we're removing our question about, about abolish ICE away from campaigns and we're doing it within this incredible opportunity of, of a public hearing. And that preparation came behind the scenes uh, to ensure that the legislation was drafted, invitations were sent. And so I wanna say thank you to uh, my senior advisor, Cesar Vargas, Chief of Staff, Sociata Meng, our communication, communications director, Tony Chiarito, uh, the whole committee staff, Council Harbani, Ahuja, Committee Policy Analyst Elizabeth Kronk, Finance Analyst Ji Jin Lee. Uh, thank you for your incredible work as well. I'm gonna call the first panel. Uh, this is gonna be a panel to really set the tone for this discussion uh, with some real direct impact uh, to their work or to their life here as a resident in the city of New York. The first, uh, or to the, to the dais uh, from the Legal Aid Society, Hassan uh, Shafakia. Uh, Niyasa Hickey from the Brooklyn Defender Services, um, Albert Kahn uh, from CARE New York, and then also uh, a resident from Sunset Park, Violeta Gomez Uribe, uh, who will speak about, about her, her experience. And then finally, I will read a story that uh, her name is Sandy, uh, was not, did not feel comfortable to be here in front of us today, but did consent 
to reading her story. And so I will be reading her story, and she's from Make the Road, New York. Uh, Violeta, would you like to start? Yes, I'm not sure how this works, so bear with me. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the Immigration Committee of the City Council of New York for the opportunity to give my testimony. I am Violeta Gomez Uribe, and, the, and for the past 30 years, I have been a proud undocumented New Yorker that received deferred action for childhood arrivals some years ago. But make no mistake, I'm not the only one. I'm one of million undocumented New Yorkers that for many reasons cannot be here today. As a community advocate, my mission is to bring my family and my community to every space I place foot in. I'm here to speak about the importance not only of Intro 1092, but about the importance of making New York City a true sanitary city. I'm here to talk about the most important stories, the ones that don't make it to the headlines, the news headlines. I'm here to talk about the stories that I hear and see every day as I walk every corner of New York City. I'm here to bring the story of the mother that won't seek essential services for her child with special needs because she fears of being accused of public charge. I'm here to bring the story of the men and women who every single day go to work even if they're sick. I'm here to bring the story of, immigrant that face, of the immigrant that faces sickness and silence for the fear of seeking health and being transferred to ICE. I'm here to bring the story of 40 plus construction workers that were recently fraud with $500 each by a so-called lawyer that told them that they were going to get an OSHA certification. I'm here to bring the story of the families that are being sexually harassed by the super of their building with the threat of calling ICE if they don't surrender sexual favors. I'm here to bring the story of the teen that took his life because he was undocumented and saw no hope in his future. I'm here to bring the story of undocumented immigrants that will tolerate all sorts of abuses because of fear. As you might infer, I can spend countless of hours bringing you stories of, an, of our undocumented community. Finally, I'm here to bring you these stories, but I'm here to ask you to take these stories with you and hopefully have them every step of the way to make sure to create laws that will truly protect our undocumented brothers and sisters. I'm here to ask you to take these stories not as an act of pity, but as an lack of acknowledgement of our humanity and, a, and the huge contributions we, the undocumented community, make to this city. Thank you. Thank you, Violeta. Thank you so much for your words. That was really beautiful. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Albert Fox Khan, and I serve as the legal director for CARE New York. And I speak in support of the pre-considered introduction prohibiting city contracts with immigration enforcement entities. I, I have to say how proud I am to be here in this, with this council to see the leadership from Chairman Chaka, from Speaker Johnson, from Helen Rosenthal, making a moral stance against immoral immigration enforcement because we see all too frequently the toll it takes on communities across New York City. Uh, these remarks are just an excerpt of the longer written statement, but I, I'm here to point out that this is a step, a crucial step, but one of many that is needed to protect our city from the Trump administration's campaign against immigrant communities. Crucially, the council must also address the myriad of ways that the New York City Police Department directly and indirectly aids ICE in their enforcement work. At the start of this year, Mayor Bill de Blasio reiterated his promise that our police and employees will not be part of the federal deportation force. However, just a few months later, we learned that ICE's New York office targeted individuals who had been fingerprinted by the NYPD demanding that these New Yorkers appear at ICE's office and placing many in deportation proceedings. The NYPD's sweeping surveillance of communities of color 
is innately intertwined with immigration enforcement. It's hard to address one without addressing the other. And without accountability and transparency for the collection, retention, and sharing of New Yorkers' data, there can be no meaningful commitment that ICE does not have the access to enforce immigration law against our fellow neighbors. In an alarming case earlier this year, NYPD renewed a contract with a private firm, Vigilant Solutions, exchanging information from automated license plate readers. And this partnership raised serious concerns that only in, uh, intensified following reports in January that ICE contracted with the very same vendor to gain access to license plate information from all across the country. We've been given assurances that the contract renewal protected New Yorkers' location data. And we appreciate those promises, but we need more. We need comprehensive protection for immigrant New Yorkers. The one measure that CARE New York is supporting in addition to the measures before you today is the POST Act, a bill to promote oversight of surveillance technology. I, I want to simply, again, express my gratitude that the Council is taking the measures here today to protect our city from the Trump administration's campaign against immigrant communities. However, I hope this will be merely one part of a broader campaign to safeguard the rights of all New Yorkers. And I call upon the Council to also work with advocates to quickly address the impact of NYPD surveillance on immigrant New Yorkers and make sure that this city is truly a sanctuary for all. Hi, my name is Niasa Hickey. I'm a supervising attorney of the immigration practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. We are proud to join the city council to demand a fundamental transformation of our immigration system to one that recognizes the humanity of all people and upholds the values of equal justice and due process for all. The problems with our immigration system date back to before the creation of ICE and apply to agencies beyond ICE. Simply abolishing ICE will not address all of the issues um, that we identified in our written testimony. The impact of enforcement policies at the federal level are felt every day by our immigrant clients and their families. We have testified extensively about all of these issues in previous hearings, and we have a long list of those concerns in our written testimony. But I want to use the few minutes I have today to urge the Council to think critically about the temporary measures that we take to support immigration reform without harming our communities. I speak specifically about the recent campaigns to end ICE contracts with jails in New Jersey. As a public defender office, Brooklyn Defender Services strongly supports closing jails and prisons. However, in this case, we know that our communities will be deeply harmed if local immigration facilities are closed. ICE has made very clear that they will not end or change their enforcement tactics, even if local detention centers are closed. This has already happened in San Francisco in the Bay Area earlier this summer. Advocates urged local officials to end their contracts with ICE. Detention centers uh, closed. ICE moved all of the people in the local immigration detention facilities out of state. They have not stopped making ICE arrests. They are, not, they are still relying on violations of due process and unconscionable ruses to terrorize immigrant communities. So what happened to the people who were moved out of state? They're now far away from their families whose support is critical to their deportation defense. Those families also provide moral and essential evidence to prove their legal claims. They are far away from publicly funded immigration attorneys modeled after those in the NIFA program in New York City. We know that deportation defense programs like NIFUP increases a person's ability to stay in this country by 1,100% as compared to people who face deportation prior to the creation of NIFUP. ICE targets people in and around courthouses. We know this. If they're transferred out of state by ICE, this makes it even more difficult to resolve their current underlying criminal cases. NIFUP not only provides experienced and highly qualified attorneys in immigration court, but also other essential services, such as in investigation support, social workers, expert witnesses, reentry services, connection to rehabilitative programs and services, and experienced litigators who can challenge decisions by immigration judges in federal courts. So the New Jersey detention facilities house the detained people whose cases are heard at Varick Street Immigration Courthouse. If those contracts in those facilities end, 
New Yorkers will be transferred out of state and the city will have no way to provide them with the quality representation that they currently receive through NIFA. So we propose that the city council work with our counterparts in New Jersey, the Hudson, Bergen, and Essex County freeholders, and urge them to continue their contracts with ICE while improving conditions for detainees, improving access to medical care, visitation, and other measures. We also ask that you encourage the freeholders to identify people in immigration detention who have upcoming court dates before their initial court date. We know that the um, NIFUP has been impacted with the move to the video, video conference facilities. So if um, the local jails identify people who are in those facilities before their first master calendar, then NIFUP can go to those facilities prior to the first court date to do screenings and intake, um, a process that has been fundamentally undermined um, uh, currently because ICE has stopped bringing people, detained people, to the Varick Street Court. These and other advocacy efforts could go a long way towards supporting immigrant New Yorkers and ensuring that they're able to take advantage of NIFEP representation. I'm happy to answer additional questions um, about this issue or any of my written remarks. One quick question. Can you just clarify for us that the actions that you're reporting to us tonight, today, uh, the video conferencing and essentially the closing of these detention centers, was a direct action by ICE? And can you walk us through a little bit about that, the kind of decision-making process and that it was in fact connected to ICE and their, and their power? So I don't know enough about the San Francisco, uh, yeah, the, the San Francisco um, Bay Area detention centers and who exactly, whether it was ICE that closed those, but it was a reaction to the, low, the community um, pressuring um, and protesting um, the detention facilities, which is why those detention centers were closed and then the people were transferred out of state. So ICE did, is still, like I said, arresting those individuals, still processing them, but they're processing them in detention centers much further away. Um, and ICE is the, is the agency that um, has decided to stop producing individuals to immigration court. Um, and as a result, they're moving completely to video conference. And so um, the ability for attorneys to meet with an individual on their first court date to understand their immigration relief, look at the evidence against them, and meaningfully um, advocate for bond or for some relief on that first court date is um, greatly undermined. So um, the, my, the point of my testimony is that, the, that there are temporary measures that um, the city council and um, the community can take to um, increase access uh, to individuals who are detained so that they can meaningfully fight their case while we are also working towards um, the abolishing of the immigration detention and deportation system that we know it. But we have to think thoughtfully about how those two are interacting. Thank you. Hassan. Good afternoon. My name is Hassan Shafikullah. I'm the attorney in charge of the Immigration Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. Thank you, Chairman Chaka, Speaker Johnson, and all the council members for holding this hearing. Um, so I'm going to just briefly summarize my written testimony, um, which is that ICE is an agency that's out of control. Um, and we see the effect of ICE's actions on our clients every day. Just at Legal Aid in the last year, we've had six clients who are US citizens who are facing deportation by an agency and by an immigration court system that had no jurisdiction over them. Um, and it was only thanks to NIFAP, which um, the council has been funding for the last four years, that we were able to step in and identify them and take them out of the deportation machinery. Um, ICE is holding people in jails, even though they call it civil detention, where they fail to provide the most basic medical care. One of our clients lost a toe in ICE detention because they didn't give him the care that he needed. Um, and he's seeking his remedies now, but he's never going to get his toe back. We need oversight and accountability to improve the conditions in ICE jails. Um, ICE is continuing to abduct our clients from New York courthouses. Um, ICE was spotted near a courthouse um, this afternoon. Um, and that's having an impact on the administration of justice in our courts, where um, individuals who are appearing in court to fight their cases are afraid to show up, material witnesses are afraid to come, and domestic violence survivors are afraid to show up and seek orders of protection. Um, and all of that's making our communities less safe. Um, as my colleague Niasa Hickey mentioned, ICE has switched to um, video conferencing at the detained immigration court for no um, justifiable reason. And this means that um, our clients are 
materially prejudiced. They can't meet with their attorneys in a confidential setting before their first hearing in front of an immigration judge. It's on camera with ICE there and the judge in front of them. Um, they can't meet with their family members. That's often the only time that they can see their family members is in court while they're in detention because the centers are so far away um, from New York City. Um, it's an, also an opportunity typically for the attorneys to have their clients sign forms and, and just do basic things that a lawyers and, and their clients do. But if our client is on a screen remotely from Bergen or one of the other jails, we can't do that. Um, and it just dehumanizes our clients. So much of what happens in immigration court is discretionary with the immigration judge. And if I'm trying to show that my client has rehabilitated herself and is a safe person to be in the community, and the judge is seeing a two-dimensional face, a disembodied head on a screen, it just makes the client's case much harder to do. And, and she's really suffering as a result of it. Um, so in all the different ways that ICE is really terrorizing our communities, um, it's, a, it's great that the council is supporting this resolution to, um, to address ICE's behavior. But whether ICE is abolished or if, whether it's reformed, because the enforcement activities are going to happen in some way, whatever we call the agency. Um, we need to make sure that ICE is finally held accountable. But really, all this stems from President Trump's indiscriminate enforcement priorities, where everyone is targeted and everyone is facing removal. And so the, the challenges ahead of us are great, but um, the worst excesses are being exercised by ICE. And um, we applaud the city council for supporting this resolution. Thank you, and I want to I want to start with a few questions uh, before I hand it over to any colleagues that might have some questions for this panel before we head over to the administration, who will present their full testimony. And what what's really important about this discussion is the connection of the city itself and our taxpayer-funded initiatives that are supporting the defense of our community who find themselves in a deportation proceeding. And I think that's an important thing to talk about and link the reason before, uh, between, uh, between a federal enforcement agency and the due process questions and the ability for our lawyers that we're paying to go and do their work. Uh, and so what I wanna kinda hear from you all is that impact uh, is, is, is impacting the ability for your, for your lawyers to go out. How, how are you measuring that impact uh, in terms of, uh, well, actually, I'll just leave that question open. How are you measuring that impact to the ability for these contracts to do their work? So I'll start. So in a couple of different ways. One is simply in, in terms of the amount of time that somebody's sitting in detention. If, if my client, my potential client, is produced by ICE physically, as, as ICE should produce them, in the morning of their first hearing in immigration court. I have a chance to meet with them, figure out what their options are, what defenses we might have, and start moving the case forward. If the first time that I'm meeting with them is in front of a judge and in front of ICE, where I can't have a confidential communication, all I'm going to be doing is asking for an adjournment, and my client is gonna be sitting in detention longer. I can go out to the jails to meet with her for the first time. The jails are 35 or 70 miles away, so it's a, it's a several hour commitment to go out there and meet with people versus meeting with all of the potential clients at Varick Street in a given morning. And so um, we're measuring it in terms of the amount of time somebody's sitting in detention and just the amount of um, attorney hours that we're spending unnecessarily traveling to jails to meet with people that we could just meet at Varick Street. Those are just two metrics that are off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I would just add to that. Um, the ability to respond to evidence that may be produced in court. If your client isn't sitting next to you in court, and then you're unable to conference that and talk to talk about that, as well as, um, uh, as as Hassan said, um, talking about uh, humanizing our clients and um, how judges, as well as the trial attorneys, the government attorneys, view our clients is absolutely impacted. Um, length of detention, adjournments. Um, and just your client's confidence in you as an attorney. It's so much of the work as somebody's attorney is being able to build that client rapport and having those subtle communications. Um, and if your client is on a video screen um, and that video feed may be interrupted or um, maybe the client doesn't speak English fluently and is using an interpreter. All, all pieces like that are impacted, um, and we're certainly working on gathering that information. That'd be great for any kind of sense of reporting that we can get uh, in real time about that impact. 
as we move through the fiscal year to understand exactly what's um, what's happening to the the budget that we pass that has a very kind of particular um, public interest. So it'd be good to kind of get get information in real time. I think the other piece that I want to make sure that members of this committee really understand as part of this first of its kind municipally funded public defender system is that essentially many unknown New Yorkers are going through a deportation proceeding after being detained and it is in the physical presence of the court where you are able to stop them and ask them, do you have a lawyer? Can you afford a lawyer? If those answers are no, you can step in and begin that process. Walk us through that, and I think that's an important thing for everyone here to understand, that this is not just about uh, kind of perfecting this idea of having presence in a courtroom, but really the physical nature of interrupting that moment where someone will get into a court without a lawyer and not have due process. So I have an example to give you. This is one of our clients who was featured in the New Yorker recently. So, um, and I'll use his name because it's, it's been a public story. James Bussey was held for over 50 days um, at one of the ICE jails and was ready to give up. He said, just send me back to a country where I haven't lived in since I was a child. I just can't take detention anymore. And we met with him and we, it, this was before video conferencing started. And so we said, just give us a couple hours. Let us just talk to you, talk to your family members, let's find out what's going on. Found out that he, he had actually derived citizenship through his mother and said, give us two days to try to prove you're a citizen and you don't have to leave the country. Don't give up. It actually took a lot to convince him to even hang in for a couple more hours. Um, we got the evidence from his mother about how when she became a citizen and when he got his green card, and um, he was willing to stay and fight, but if we didn't have that opportunity, if he was just a face on a screen, we don't have that moment to pull him on side and just be like, don't give up on us. I just wanna say, by the way, when we gave ICE evidence of his citizenship, they still didn't release him. We had to file a habeas petition in federal court to finally get him out. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, members of the, uh, does anybody have any questions for this panel? Okay, we have one question uh, from Councilmember Yeager, and if we can put the clock at two minutes, please. Thank you. Two minutes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this uh, question, uh, anyone can answer it, really, but uh, I'd like to start with the ones uh, on the panel who most recently spoke about this, Ms. Hickey and um, Mr. Shafiqwa. Okay, perfect. You mentioned that, uh, that uh, ICE or the Immigration Court at Barrack Street recently changed its policy uh, from in-person hearings where you're sitting next to your client and you have the ability to interact with your client and to a policy of video conferencing. And that was relatively recent, right? Yes, sir. Okay. What, uh, what, what was going on at the courthouse, if you can enlighten us immediately prior there to that may have made ICE change its policy? Sure. So it, it was a specific event on a Monday morning when ICE was bringing in a bus load of our clients or potential clients to the jail. A group of activists called Occupy ICE blocked the garage entrance to the courthouse at 201 Barrick Street and the bus couldn't get in and so it turned around and, and took the, the folks back to, to their detention center and I said, we're, we're canceling hearings today. So, which, which makes sense. So the so so just to be but clear, but I want to clarify what happened then. Let oh, me just okay. give you three days in a row. Sure. So the second day, the the protesters moved across the street. There was no blockage whatsoever, and ICE could come in and out, and they could bring in folks, and the buses had no problem. But ICE said we're not going to bring them anyway. We're going to have folks um, appear by video conference. We said, well, there's no reason for that. There's no obstruction of the operation of your system. Um, but this was an opportunity for them to. It was an excuse and they haven't backed down since then. There was one day of protest. After the second day protest across the street, the group disbanded altogether. There's been no justification for it, and ICE is choosing not to back down. Well, it's possible that there was, I don't work for ICE, obviously, but is it possible that, uh, that given the fact that a bus, a uh, federally owned bus carrying people and operated by federal officers was blocked by various people who decided to put themselves in front of a bus may have given the agency reason to believe that that would happen again, particularly because the same folks were now gathered across the street? 
So I don't think it's a reasonable assumption on ISIS part because the group specifically said we're not doing this anymore and they didn't do it. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going to conclude, Mr. Chairman, if I could just have, have one more question. I'm not an apologist for them in any, in any way, but, um, I, you know, I, I, I'm a recovering lawyer. I was practiced law before I joined this council earlier this year, and I uh, give a lot of uh, credit to the need to sit next to a client and be able to pass notes and be able to interact with a client uh, prior to a hearing and during a hearing, and th that being taken away is awful. It's wrong, uh, and I believe that there should be in-person hearings. Um, but I just, the, the purpose of these questions was to point out that some of the folks who think they're helping the cause harm the cause by lying themselves in front of buses, um, and they ultimately created a situation that I felt the need to act, and w it would have been great if they didn't do that because then we wouldn't have the conversation about in-person hearings versus uh, teleconference hearings, and we could focus on the, on, on the gist and the uh, substance of the chair's uh, proposal today. Absolutely. If I can just address that with one response, well, two. One, we, we don't control the protesters, and there's a, you know, there's a robust history of protest in the city, and, and God bless. But in terms of um, the in-person, um, the benefit of being with your client, there is, of course, just being able to like sit and pass notes and all that. But I want to highlight something that's specific to NIFAP, to the program that the council has created and has supported for the last four years, which is on the very first court hearing, if I'm in detention, I'm brought into to Varick Street in the morning, and I have, it's not at, at the council table, but in a confidential setting, I can meet with my, with my potential attorney, find out what my rights are, and have a whole meaningful exploration of what's gonna happen to me and what could happen to me before appearing in court in the afternoon. And we lose that with video conferencing. We just don't have that opportunity. Even if the client is sitting in a jail through video conferencing, there's a police officer in the room with them. We don't have confidentiality. I'm, I'm not gonna ask any additional questions. I just wanna point out that, uh, like I said, the, the activists who, who block the lawful uh, practices of a government agency and do so without consulting the best interests of the client as represented by their attorneys may be harming your client's cause. And it would be best, I think, in my estimation, if you can have conversations with some of those who think that they're helping your cause by jumping in front of the buses carrying your clients and point out to them that they may have caused something that uh, is, is irretrievably gone, uh, and that is the in-person contact with their attorney, which is something that every lawyer and every client should have. Understood. Can I respond quickly? I just want to say the activist movements that have protested ICE have stopped deportations. They have kept New Yorkers who are on the verge of being sent out of this country, and they've kept them safe. They've been instrumental in this movement, and I think it is incorrect to simply assume that ICE's stated justification for a policy change is the actual reason for that policy change, and we shouldn't simply accept that due process should be optional when they find it inconvenient. Then thank you, Albert, for that. And we're gonna move over to the administration, and as we move and, and bring up the commissioner, I wanna make sure that we uh, maintain our commitment to uh, some of these foundational questions about constitutional rights like due process, uh, like access to our lawyers, and as a city-funded program like Knife Up, that we maintain that commitment to the public that we are doing the work that we're doing, and uh, perfect timing for the administration to come on board and talk to us a little bit about their thoughts on, on these questions uh, at this hearing. And we're gonna swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Yeah, great. Good afternoon. Thank you to Speaker Johnson, council member Chairman Chaka, and members of the Committee on Immigration for convening this hearing. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. This testimony will address the calls to abolish Immigration and Customs Enforcement, as well as Intro 1092. I will begin my testimony by discussing what we mean when we say abolish ICE. 
Just today, the Trump administration announced its intent to circumvent the rules and laws protecting immigrant children and expand family detention as a replacement for this family separation policy. An immigration enforcement system that subjects children to long-term detention is an intolerable system. Reforming our broken immigration system is absolutely necessary in a society that values justice and human rights. This is a historic moment, one in which people across the nation have recognized the problems created by a broken agency and by immigration laws that desperately need reform. Then I will turn to the separate question of Intro 1092. As you know, this administration strongly supports restrictions on cooperation with immigration enforcement, except in cases of public safety and national security threats. That is why we worked with the City Council to pass the detainer laws in 2014, as well as Local Law 228 in 2017. We are interested in working with the council to craft legislation that recognizes the city's intergovernmental cooperative efforts to support important public safety and national security work while furthering the goal of keeping city agencies out of the business of immigration enforcement. Turning first to the broken immigration enforcement system, I want to emphasize that the de Blasio administration has always believed that immigration enforcement is the responsibility of the federal government. Together with the city council and advocates, the city removed ICE's presence from Rikers. We also passed laws sharply limiting cooperation with federal immigration authorities where there are legitimate public safety and national security concerns, and we have continued to push for immigration reform. Relatedly, in July, the city filed a lawsuit against the Department of Justice challenging federal efforts to condition Bird and JAG funding, a state and local public safety grant on cooperation with immigration enforcement. Also, in collaboration with the council, we have poured tremendous time and energy into making sure that our city services and programs are accessible to our immigrant communities, including through the largest municipal investment in immigration legal services, the creation of IDNYC, the city's municipal ID card, and the expansion of language access requirements. These policies help ensure that New York City, the ultimate city of immigrants, is also the safest big city in America. It is abundantly clear that we need wholesale reform of ICE. The branch of ICE that conducts immigration enforcement in the interior of our country, Enforcement and Removal Operations, or ICE ERO, has caused great harm in our communities. In the New York City area, civil immigration enforcement arrests increased by 67% in the eight months after President Trump's inauguration compared to the same period in the previous year. And arrests of individuals with no criminal convictions increased by 225%. Moreover, ICE ERO has shown that it, is sim it simply does not care about the human consequences of its actions. As just one example, ICE ERO agents have arrested people in and around courthouses across New York City knowing that these arrests make immigrants, including witnesses and victims, afraid to come to court. Despite complaints from advocates, the city, council members, and district attorneys, ICE ERO has brazenly continued this practice. ICE ERO's practice make New York City less safe by instilling fear about engaging with the court system and by targeting immigrants regardless of public safety considerations. The federal government is undermining the public safety, health, and well-being of all New Yorkers. Given this context, the only logical conclusion is that we must replace our immigration enforcement system with something more reasoned and more humane. We need a fair immigration enforcement system that simultaneously promotes safety and national security, not one that could ever countenance separating children from their families. Any reform of ICE should provide a mandate that includes prioritized enforcement focusing enforcement resources on the advancement of public safety and national security. As one example of how ICE has failed in this regard, ICE is responsible for administering this country's immigration detention system. But ICE detains immigrants without any consideration for whether those pose a public safety risk, and this includes the detention of families and children. 
And as I mentioned earlier, the Trump administration announced just this morning its intention to change the rules to allow for long-term detention of children. This is not what a humane immigration system looks like. Along with prioritization, immigration enforcement should be accompanied by a duty to ensure that all of those who are in need of humanitarian protection or other forms of relief have a fair opportunity to seek that relief. A humane immigration enforcement system should be focused on making sure people fleeing violence or with claims of persecution have a chance to make those claims. Another proposal that has been discussed is separating the ICE sub-agency that investigates bona fide public safety and national security threats, ICE Homeland Security Investigations, out from the umbrella of ICE itself. ICE HSI's responsibilities include investigating human trafficking, child exploitation, international crime, military arms proliferation, drug smuggling, and many other serious crimes. In a recent letter to the Secretary of Homeland Security, many of HSI's own leaders have called for its separation from ICE, characterizing the move as one that would promote HSI's ability to conduct investigations against transnational criminal organizations and terrorists. From the city's perspective, this HSI work should continue. They are important criminal law enforcement functions and also include support for victims of trafficking and other crimes. I want to take a step back, however, and emphasize that no reform of ICE will be enough to fix the broken immigration system. For decades, Congress has been unable to pass comprehensive immigration reform. We must continue to press Congress to fix our immigration laws and to create a system that reflects the need for a path to citizenship for this country's undocumented population. Family reunification protects those fleeing persecution and disaster and promotes public safety and national security. Turning to the second issue presented today, I want to briefly in testify on intro 1092. This administration strongly believes that the city should not support immigration enforcement except where there are legitimate public safety or national security concerns. For that reason, we worked closely with the council, as noted, in creating our detainer laws, which restrict cooperation with federal immigration detainer requests, except where an individual represents a public safety threat and the city has received sufficient evidence of probable cause of removability. We also worked with the council to pass Local Law 228, largely prohibiting the use of city resources for the purposes of immigration enforcement. This is in addition to several other laws we worked together to pass, restricting non-local law enforcement from accessing non-public areas of city property and creating a framework to protect identifying information. These laws recognize the importance of distinguishing local law enforcement from federal immigration authorities, while allowing cooperation where it, adva it advances public safety. This is a priority for this administration. We believe that all New Yorkers are safer when everyone, including immigrants, feel comfortable interacting with NYPD and accessing city services. We agree with the bill's goals of ensuring that the city does not act in a way that creates confusion about our role in immigration enforcement. And we look forward to working with you to realize that goal while ensuring that the city can continue providing goods and services to agencies engaged in important criminal justice work or counterterrorism. Based on our review, we've determined that at present, there are two city agreements with the Department of Homeland Security that could be affected by the proposed bill. Neither is related to civil immigration enforcement. Recent reporting also mentioned a third agreement, which, which I will explain is not between the city and DHS. The first active agreement is an MOU with NYPD for the use of its Rodman's Neck firing range in the Bronx. This MOU allows ICE HSI to use the firing range for its own certification. As I mentioned earlier, ICE HSI conducts various crucial anti-terrorism, anti-trafficking, criminal justice activities, and is separate from ICE ERO, which is tasked with civil immigration enforcement. NYPD also has similar arrangements with other city, state, and federal law enforcement agencies that use this range. The other contract is between the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the Department of Homeland Security. The DOHMH Public Health Laboratory is a host lab 
for the DHS Office of Health Affairs BioWatch program for purposes of monitoring the air for agents likely to be used in bioterrorism attacks. This contract serves extremely important national security interests and again is unrelated to civil immigration enforcement. A recent news article on this topic also discussed the Hudson River Park Trust's rental parking spots to ICE. The trust is not a city agency and the city does not control or direct its contracts. We look forward to working with the council to ensure that the city can continue to work with federal agencies for purposes of combating terrorism and engaging in criminal justice work. In addition, we will work with you to ensure that the city may continue to contribute to the many interagency task forces it is a part of that are engaged in crucial criminal justice and national security work. The de Blasio administration supports wholesale replacement of ICE and immigration enforcement more broadly. We need a system that promotes public safety and national security and not a system that characterizes all immigrants as threats. Similarly, we will work to continue to work with the council to ensure that intro 1092 builds on recent legislation in providing for adequate restrictions on cooperation with civil immigration enforcement while guaranteeing that important counterterrorism and criminal justice work appropriately continues. We look forward to speaking further with the council about these two important issues and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and your work uh, that you all did to uncover the relationships that we have contractually, revenue contracts. And I just wanna do a couple quick questions and clarifying that th there are essentially only two contracts that you found in your exercise. Can you talk a little bit about how extensive that was? Uh, is it possible that there are other contracts? You just need more time uh, and get us, give us a sense about, about identifying those kind of contracts in real time and the role maybe that Moya takes pre, post passing of this law to identify uh, future contract decisions and the process. Just get, 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 let's get into the mechanics of this. Sure, so um, uh, in kind of undertaking the research and the effort to see what the city actually held, we worked closely with the Office of Management and Budget um, and um, contracting to make sure that uh, all of the systems that register the contracts were being searched and, uh, and effectively and thoroughly searched to ensure that uh, we were catching any possible contract that might exist. Um, they also supported in helping to uh, reach out to individual agencies um, and ensure that we weren't missing anything because of course the contracts are uh, entered into individually by the agencies um, themselves. So uh, we, it took some time, but we feel like um, we have exhausted uh, all of the appropriate measures and and identifying and unearthing um, things that exist. Um, and um, as noted, these are the two formal agreements um, that we unearth that are in place. Does the role is there a role for the Moya Task Force? Uh, through and connected to local law 186 of 2017 to do some of this work. Uh, again, in a world where, where we are monitoring this and it becomes some form of sure. legal mandate to not contract with immigration agencies. Yeah, I mean, enforcement I agencies. Sure, so I think um, to answer the second part of your initial question, you know, Moya, we certainly see our role as wanting to uh, ensure that we're both responding to issues that are raised to us that might not already be on our radar, um, but also effectively being responsive and transparent to what the city is doing and the impact on our communities. So that's why we would undertake such an endeavor as we did in this case. I think in terms of um, sort of what makes sense for co continued or ongoing monitoring or understanding, I think in the creation of Local Law 228, a framework was actually already created in which should there be a request um, by immigra for immigration enforcement or to advance immigration enforcement to any city agency, Moya is the designated agency that must be alerted through the reporting um, in that uh, legislation. Um, I think that was appropriately chosen um, and it certainly has been 
um, what, what we think is a very useful exercise with agencies in helping them think through these issues. So um, I think that that is sort of one, one example that potentially might, might be appropriate here. And then finally, what are the amounts, how big are these contracts? The fire and range and then the bio watch? Yeah, so um, the NYPD MOU has a um, uh, essentially broad agreement. It's for um, a five year period and it provides for payment up to $139,000 in total. It's a very limited contract. It essentially is, as I said, just for use of the uh, range and to ensure that there's a safety officer that's present to make sure that nothing that's being done is unsafe for the for others who are present. Um, and for the DOHMH agreement, this is a obviously a extremely important and critical um, piece of work, and so. Um, it is important and essential to, to DOHMH and to the city of New York that this work happens, and the agreement is such that uh, where feasible at the end of the year, DOHMH can, um, uh, we'll see some reimbursement from uh, DHS for the use of its lab, but ultimately it's an in-kind through the support of staff agreement um, where DHS uh, supports the salary of the staff that's there doing this work. So last year, our understanding is that DOHMH received approximately $50,000. Um, and in some years, it was more or less or no reimbursement at all. Thank you. Uh, Speaker Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, of course, for your testimony and for everything uh, that you do. I want to just uh, get a little more granular on uh, the questions related to the contracts with uh, DHS and ICE. I know that Councilmember Chaka, the chair, was just asking these questions, but I want to just dig a little deeper. So, of course, in your testimony, you mentioned that uh, HSI, Homeland Security Investigations, which is, as you mentioned in your testimony, a component of ICE. You said it has a contract with the NYPD for Robin's Neck firing range, uh, the use of the police department's firing range in the Bronx. I believe it's in Councilmember Jonai's district. Um, <clears throat> is there a component in this contract that you know of where the NYPD has to share any data on persons arrested in New York City? Uh, no, there is not. There's not. That's good news. Yes. And does Moya know if other municipalities have similar contracts with HSI to use their police department's firing range? Um, I do know, do not know that specific question. I do know broadly that other municipalities have very different uh, kinds of contracts. I think you just heard in the previous panel, of course, um, in, New in New Jersey, there are some, um, there are some jails um, that exist in other cities across the country, but specifically for use of a firing range, I'm not sure. What I'll say about Rodman's Neck that's unique is that this is a very large facility. ICE HSI is not the only entity for, uh, with which NYPD contracts for use of this location. Um, every, every sort of uh, criminal justice entity you might think of, the DOJ, IRS, special agents, New York State Police, MTA, CUNY peace officers, et cetera. So this is uh, a location that's used um, broadly by criminal justice officers that work in and around New York City uh, to to practice, to train, to receive certification, et cetera. Thank you. Sure. Uh, what is the process for approval of contracts like these uh, from DHS and HSI that could potentially impact immigrant communities? What I mean by that is, do you know if individual commissioners sign off or does OMB sign off and then disperse to individual agencies? Is Moya involved in this process at all? Uh, for federal reimbursement? Moya has not been involved in a process uh, of any contracts that involve DHS. And um, as I noted previously, often this is individual agencies that are engaging um, with, uh, with DHS for, the, for the, the entering into the agreement. They obviously report this to OMB, which is why we have the broader system, and they must um, issue the agreements, and that goes through normal city 
rules. Uh, so of course they're in the system and that's why we were able to locate them um, and know how best to be responsive, but there's no process that exists um, currently where entering into an agreement with DHS would be something that, that Moya would be alerted to. Thank you very much for Thank being you. here today and for answering our questions. Thank you, Chairman Chaka. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Holden. Yes. Thanks, Commissioner, for your testimony. Um, so the administration really does not support intro 1092. Is that what you're saying? No, that's not what I said at all. I think, as I said, I think that there, the goals of the bill we agree with, which is to further limit, uh, ensure that we're limiting cooperation with civil immigration enforcement. But we believe we will, we will need to do some work together to make sure that it also satisfies goals that we have as a city in ensuring that we have the flexibility uh, to engage in agreements and activities where it advances public safety and national security as we have done in our other legislation. Well, national security would mean um, training uh, police officers uh, in the firing range and also uh, peace officers like uh, ICE agents. I would want them to be able to shoot straight, wouldn't you? Absolutely, and I think right. you know what we've just what we have noted and what I noted in my testimony is I, I think we have struck the right balance in right. previous legislation that we've worked on together and feel confident that we can do so here. Okay, you said to abolish ICE and replace it with something more humane, which we don't know what that is yet. So replacing ICE with an unknown entity, um, that's, that's the administration's stance, but does the ICE do anything well? The ICE enforcement agents do anything well? Um, like remove criminals? Um, yeah. Serious criminals that, that uh, offer a threat to public safety and, and our security? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think uh, the answer to that is absolutely. Yes, and yes. I haven't heard that today. Um, I think I, I did note that um, simply in, in specifically even articulating the work of, of ICE HSI, which we know is extremely important. They conduct right. criminal investigations. Right. I noted the city's own agree agreement through our detainer policies in cooperating with our public security uh, considerations where people have been convicted of violent and serious crimes. So certainly we would agree that what we're talking about is uh, is not a complete end to all uh, immigration enforcement, but one that puts central to that the public safety considerations. And obviously you could go through the motions of saying, uh, you know, abolish or end uh, separating families, abolish or end overbroad enforcement. Well, the, the fa yeah, but the family <laughs> on one side, we, we, could, we could throw children in there and, and make it sound, oh, this is a horrible agency, and th this is a strong army, but they remove people that are, by and large, most of the, of the people, and uh, immigrants uh, with past criminal convictions accounted for 74% of all arrests made by ICE agents in fiscal 2017. So they are removing people with criminal past wanted in, in uh, their other countries and, cer and certainly present a threat to New York City residents, which again, I think we have to weigh both here. And, and I, I know there were abuses, but correct the abuses, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I think, uh, and, and again, I lived through 9-11 like most people, um, and my family was affected by it. And the problem with 9-11, one of the causes with the city agencies, uh, city, state, and federal uh, agencies weren't communicating. Mm -hmm. So we tried to do that with uh, Homeland Security. Um, and, and, you know, ICE tells, uh, tells us that uh, New York City police ignored 1,526 requests for, for, uh, from federal immigration and, uh, and customs enforcement to detain undocumented immigrants for up to 48 hours last year. Um, I don't know if that's helping with the public safety of New York City residents by doing that. So, you know, if you could just respond to that, because I think my time is up. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no good. So I guess a few, a few things to say. I think we are in a, a agreement in terms of there are clearly parts of the duty that are within the mandate of ICE as it currently exists that we would advocate for continuing. Um, I think how you break that down and what that looks like ultimately fundamentally is the responsibility of Congress. I think what this conversation allows is to say we have a problem. The way that it currently operates 
uh, extends far beyond what might be understood as their mandate, is instilling fear in communities, is needlessly targeting individuals who have no criminal history, who have no convictions whatsoever. As I noted in my testimony, over 225% increase in people with absolutely no interaction with the criminal justice system last year. That has a tremendous impact on us here in New York City. So I think there's fundamental agreement that there are certain responsibilities that the agency as it currently exists that holds that ought to continue. I think the question that's being raised here simply is, what does that look like? How does it have increased accountability? How is, are there measures that are undertaken to make sure that there's adequate reporting and responsibility? I think in terms of the city's role, that's a separate question. The city has made it clear that we do not conduct immigration enforcement. That is not our job, and in fact, uh, we know that that has helped us from a security and safety perspective because it increases people's ability and willingness to come forward and report crimes in our city. I think what we have come to an agreement on is what are the, the limits to that non-cooperation? You noted things like concerns that, that agencies were not speaking to each other after nine, before 9-11. That is why we are involved with uh, the Joint Terrorism Task Force. That is why we are part of the Joint uh, Trafficking Task Force. That is why these task forces particularly are exempted from restricting cooperation under, the, under Local Law 228. So I do think we are aiming to strike the right balance as a city of ensuring that we're furthering communication where national security work and public safety is central and crucial while asking the right questions about what is, go what is going too far, what's not working with the agencies, what isn't advancing those public safety interests. Thank you, Commissioner. Next, we have uh, Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Madam Commissioner, thank you very much for your work uh, with my office and my colleagues here uh, for the work you do to help the immigrants in our communities. Um, I just have a real couple of quick questions. Uh, the city's contract with, uh, with the NYPD's MOU with, um, with ICE for the use of the Throgs Neck firing range. If uh, tomorrow morning the city said that ICE can't use the Throgs Neck firing range anymore, would ICE shut down to the best of your knowledge based on your familiarity with the agency? Um, I just want one point of clarity, which is to say that the MOU is limited. It is only with ICE's HSI division, which is the Criminal if, Investigations if the, Division. If Were it to end, no, ICE would not shut down. ICE would not shut down, okay. So, <laughs> um, and with regard to uh, DOH's contract uh, to monitor the air, um, which obviously is not just being done for ICE, but it's also being done for me and probably for you as well and everybody on this council and all the eight and change million people that we represent, uh, if that MOU were to end tomorrow, would I shut down? Um, again, the, I, obviously I can't speak for ICE nor its full operations. Based on your but best I would familiarity based with the agency? Best, no. Okay. The uh, statute uh, that is being uh, proposed here in the council, intro 1092, if this law were enacted to the best of your knowledge based on your familiarity with the agency, would I shut down? Um, to the best of my knowledge and familiarity, no, I don't believe it would shut down its operations. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Yeager. Uh, and I want to take a quick moment. There was some information that was uh, presented by uh, Councilmember Holden about the sense of criminality, and I just want to read something from our report, actually, that we produced here, and I encourage all the members of the Council to read it. Uh, as, the, um, as the hearing continues, the report shows that ICE has detained 65% more immigrants in fiscal year 2018 than the previous year, making the Enforcement and Removal Operations, ERO, who are not part of this MOU, right? This just uh, HSI. So essentially, ERO is not invited to be part of the use of the contract that we're talking about. But this division uh, roughly is the seventh largest prison system in the country. More specifically, the detentions of immigrants with no criminal records more than doubled in the first year of Trump's administration from 5,498 in 2016 to 13,600 in 2017. So this idea that ICE is focusing on criminals 
um, as a talking point is just uh, is just not correct. And really, what what's happening in is there's a, there's a larger kind of um, a net of people that are being rounded up and accused uh, without any kind of due process that we also discussed in the courts um, to have any kind of representation. That's what we're talking about today, and those are the facts. I want to add, ask uh, Councilmember Matthew Eugene if you have any comments or questions before. Not yet, okay. <laughs> uh, and so to close us out, uh, I want to uh, give uh, Councilmember Joe and I uh, two minutes for questions or a statement. Thank you, Chairman. I, I don't have any questions, but I do want to make a statement. Um, immigration is a sensitive, passionate issue. I am the son of immigrants. Firsthand, um, I've experienced in my own household and community. As the only elected Albanian in the state of New York, it falls on my office and my previous position to meet the needs of many of the Albanian community and the constituents that I represented to help through their immigration problems. I am in full support of reforming our immigration system. But when it comes to the resolution, um, I appreciate the values that, we, that have made this country a beacon of hope the world over. Principles such as respect and dignity are at the heart of who we are as a nation. As we seek to enforce the country's immigration laws, we must do so in a way that treats everyone with the dignity and respect that they deserve. So while I support reforming our immigration enforcement system so that it is humane and respectful, I cannot in good conscience vote to abolish ICE when there is no viable proposal on the table to replace it and do the vital work that is under the agency's mission. So with a tremendous respect to my colleagues, those that were heard today, and the heartfelt intentions, I cannot support the resolution. In regards to intro 1092, until we have a plan to reform our immigration enforcement system, or a viable alternative agency or agencies to take over the duties of ICE. I cannot support or vote to deny the one thing that we can all agree with, that no matter which agency is in charge with enforcement, we want those officers to be well-trained, to uphold the laws, and while doing so, treat people humanely and respectfully. Currently, that agency is ICE. And again, while I firmly believe that we must reform our immigration system, I cannot vote to take away our role to help ensure that these agents are trained to hopefully do the best job that they can in carrying out their missions. Thus, I cannot support Intro 1092 in its current form. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Joni. And uh, for for the administration, a couple more questions on NYPD, just so we can get it on the record. Uh, there, there were conversations about, and, and we alluded it, alluded to it in our opening statements about the decline in calls from immigrants regarding domestic violence or petty crimes, and really working in cooperation with NYPD as part of the civic fabric of a neighborhood and public safety, as we understand it, on the ground as neighbors. Uh, has Moya seen any decrease through its relationship with NYPD in those immigrant communities connecting to our local municipal uh, enforcement officers? Uh, so thanks for the question. We, you know, Moya has done some monitoring of the utilization of city services broadly and worked with NYPD in this regard. Um, we've not seen significant changes um, that speak to immediately concerning declines. Um, I think fundamentally we believe that the reason for that is because of the, what the city has done to combat against that chilling effect. Um, as early as January, following uh, the president's inauguration, Commissioner O'Neill himself distributed a letter to all officers affirming that their job is not immigration enforcement, that their job is the public safety of all New Yorkers, regardless of their status. 
Um, that uh, directive is understood and heard by all officers. We've worked closely to make sure that communities through Know Your Rights programming know that they have the right to interact with NYPD and with city services and uh, certainly in reporting crimes and not having their immigration status asked for. It has been a continued part and fabric of what we've tried to do as an administration and in, in ensuring that communities know that they can come to us. I would say that certainly in my own work and in the team's work in communities, we have anecdotally heard of increased fears and concerns um, that has led to us taking a closer uh, eye on, on making sure we're working with agencies, including NYPD, to see if there are dramatic shifts that we need to be responsive to, and we will continue to commit to doing that work. Thank you, and it'd be great to continue to monitor that as we bring this conversation forward uh, and continue to build for the reform that we need on the immigration uh, system and the eventual abolishing of ICE. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner, and uh, I hope your team can stay. We have uh, a special guest, and the technical pieces are, are, are going to come, and they'll let me know when they're ready. Uh, but we've invited academics to talk to us about what they think and the research that they're seeing on the ground that's not just agency-related information about stats on the ground with NYPD or contracts, but really an academic view about the impact of ICE. Uh, to inform us as the council as we think about this, uh, because this is an emotional uh, thing for so many of us, uh, but the facts are important as we try to understand that impact that an agency that we're calling out right now has in our neighborhood. Um, and as we get them on the line, I want to read the Make the Road member uh, who we're going to call by the name of Sandy and read her testimony and she's given us per permission and consent to share her story. My name is Sandy and I am a Make the Road member whose life drastically changed when my partner Gus was detained by ICE agents one April morning. On April 10th at around 5.40 a.m. Gus was on his way out when agents appeared in unmarked cars and detained him. The agents were, wore ski masks and did not identify themselves as ICE, but rather as police. I received a call from the police via my husband's cell phone telling me to come downstairs and collect my husband's belongings. And when I arrived downstairs, I witnessed my husband's arrest and was horrified at what was happening. And as I had our two daughters soundly asleep upstairs, Gus was detained, and I did not hear from him until 11 a.m. when I was told he would be transferred to New Mexico. My story is reflective of the many issues with the rogue enforcement agencies such as ICE. Families like mine continue to be terrorized and harassed by agencies who use excessive force, fear tactics, and continue to kidnap individuals without giving their families knowledge of their whereabouts. Make the Road New York has worked with me to amplify my story and to reunite me with my partner. Not every family gets this kind of support. And I hope my story can highlight some of the horrors that community members continue to endure at the hands of ICE. Uh, and so we have invited Professor Wong uh, from California. Uh, do we have you online, Professor Wong? Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you. Can you introduce yourself uh, your, and your work and then uh, deliver to us your, your testimony? We'll have, we have members of the city council here that may want to ask you questions as well. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Chairman Chaka and other members of the Committee on Immigration for the opportunity to speak at this important hearing today. I'm a, an associate professor of political science at UC San Diego, where I specialize in the study of immigration politics and policy. Um, I've conducted uh, several research projects over the past couple of years that I think might be uh, informative for the discussion today. So last year, I conducted a nationwide analysis of the relationship between crime and policies that limit local law enforcement entanglement with federal immigration enforcement efforts. I analyzed the data set from ICE, which was obtained from a Freedom of Information Act request. 
So these data showed that crime rates were statistically significantly lower in counties that ICE itself flagged as saying no to detainer or notification requests compared to comparable counties that cooperated with ICE. In other words, crime was lower in sanctuary localities compared to comparable non-sanctuary localities. More recently, I've conducted a series of survey experiments with undocumented immigrants in San Diego County to better understand how interior immigration enforcement affects the behaviors and attitudes of undocumented immigrants. This is the largest survey project of undocumented immigrants that I'm aware of that uses the gold standard of probability-based sampling. So here are some of the results. When individuals are randomly assigned to a scenario where local law enforcement is working together with ICE, they are 60.8% less likely to report crimes that they witness to the police. They're 42.9% less likely to report crimes that they are victims of to the police. They are 69.9% less likely to use public services, for example, go to City Hall, that requires them to give them their personal contact information. They're 63.9% less likely to do business, for example, open a bank account or get a loan. That requires them to give their personal contact information. 68.3% less likely to participate in public events where police may be present. 42.9% of those with children are less likely to place their children in an after-school or daycare program and 52.1% are less likely to look for a new job. So because respondents are randomly assigned to scenarios where local law enforcement is working together with ICE and is not working together with ICE, these effects can be considered the causal effects of local cooperation with ICE. Moreover, the data further show that one of the main mechanisms that explains the chilling effects of interior immigration enforcement is decreased trust in public institutions. So in another survey experiment, similarly randomly assigning individual respondents to a scenario where local law enforcement is working together with ICE, we see that 26.6% of undocumented immigrants are less likely to trust a great deal or a lot that local law enforcement will keep them and their families safe. 22.9% are less likely to trust that local law enforcement will keep their communities safe. 25.4% are less likely to trust that local law enforcement will protect the rights of all people, including undocumented immigrants, equally. 28.3% are less likely to trust that lo local law enforcement will protect the confidentiality of witnesses to crime, even if they're undocumented. And 24.6% are less likely to trust that local law enforcement will protect undocumented immigrants from abuse or discrimination. So this research adds to a growing body of evidence that makes clear that interior immigration enforcement has wide-ranging implications that not only affect undocumented immigrants, but in many cases also their U.S. citizen children. So I'll pause here, and I thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Wong, uh, for, your, for your review in this study. And I just want to clarify or just to confirm the, the folks that you surveyed are, are undocumented members of communities across the country. Was there a specific kind of urban versus suburban uh, uh, kind of capture of, of information? Uh, tell us a little bit about, about the, like who, who, who are these undocumented members of the survey? Yeah, thank you for that question. So as we know, there's no phone book of undocumented immigrants, which makes traditional surveying of undocumented immigrants very difficult to do. But what I've been able to do is partner with the Mexican consulate in San Diego to create what we call a sample frame. So in other words, a list of phone numbers uh, from which to randomly sample from. So the individual respondents that I'm uh, referring to in the surveys are respondents uh, that we were able to speak to from this list uh, given to us by the Mexican consulate in San Diego. So the first analysis that I referred to is a nationwide study uh, of the relationship between crime and sanctuary localities. Uh, but the additional studies uh, regarding individual level behavior, as well as individual level trust, 
the, those results are born from the work done here in San Diego. And to my knowledge, there is no similar uh, study uh, to compare to, and this type of work hasn't been done on this scale elsewhere. We're, we're having the discussion today about about abolishing ICE as an, as an agency, and I think that there's there's some concern that was, you know, presented today uh, from some of the members of the council, in really kind of pointing to this relationship between between the mission of ICE as a, an enforcement agency, who's you know removing criminals uh, and fighting crime. And your statistics really kind of give us a different, a different perspective about how to understand crime in neighborhoods where immigrants live. Can you tell us a little bit about about how how in in kind of an over overview of immigrants who are reporting crime, immigrants who are connecting to public services, uh, where in 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 counties that are not cooperating with ICE? How, how public, public safety is defined in your study? Yes, so um, to walk through the, the data. So one of the questions that researchers have been asking for several years now is whether or not policies that limit local cooperation with federal immigration law enforcement officials uh, help or harm uh, various uh, public safety metrics like crime rates. And so the first study that I referenced is analyzing ICE's own data uh, and showing that crime is lower in sanctuary counties. Now, the finding that crime is lower is not an explanation. So we now need to essentially ask ourselves, why is crime lower in these jurisdictions? And this is where the individual level data come in because for almost uh, a decade now, we've been hearing from law enforcement executives like the International Association of Chiefs of Police that in order for them to do the work of community policing and to keep their community safe, they need the trust and the cooperation of immigrant communities. And to the extent that local law enforcement is working together with ICE, that erodes the trust. And so what we see uh, from my data at the individual level is that when we give these scenarios where local law enforcement is working together with ICE or is not working with ICE, uh, we actually find data to support what uh, law enforcement executives have been saying, that when there's um, entanglement with uh, federal immigration enforcement, there is less trust. So that's what we see in terms of 26.6 percent um, uh, less trusting that local law enforcement will keep their them and their family safe, for example, and that 25.4 uh, percent uh, are less trusting that local law enforcement will protect the rights of undocumented immigrants. Now that decreased trust then parlays into the overall more dramatic finding that 60.8% would be less likely to report crimes they witnessed to police, and 42.9% even would be less likely to report crimes that they were victims of, victims of to the police. And so the way that the, um, the survey responses are set up, we can also say that the inverse is true. So right now I've been saying what happens in the scenario when uh, local law enforcement is working together with ICE, but we randomly assign individuals to that second scenario where local law enforcement is not working together with ICE. And so we can say with confidence that not only is, um, is there evidence to support the chilling effects that interior immigration enforcement has on a wide range of behaviors, day-to-day um, -day behaviors of undocumented immigrants, uh, we can also say that the absence of that cooperation with ICE increases people's willingness to report crimes and work with the police, increases their likelihood of um, doing business, uh, again, opening a bank account or getting a loan, uh, even if it requires them to disclose their personal contact information, more likely to participate in public events where police may be present, and more trusting that law enforcement will keep them and their community safe and protect their rights. 
Thank you for that. I, I think I think so much of of how we started the hearing really talked to, talked about our experiences at the district office level in our council in our cons council offices in our districts, and how some of that fear comes in in stories uh, from people who are experiencing this. And already at that point, if they're in our community district offices, they have surpass that burden of fear and we are in a city as the commissioner just mentioned before you got on um, the city of new york is incredibly committed to to making that gesture codifying that into law and then recommitting in letters and memos internally so that the police department and the officers themselves know that the commissioner at the highest level is maintaining that non-cooperation with ICE and federal enforcement. How, how do you see that in your study uh, uh, defined as non-cooperation? Is it, is it all laws or is it really gestures that, that, that show community members that, they're, that their local municipality is not cooperating? How do you measure that? Is it, is it all laws? Can it be other things like just rhetoric and speeches? How, how, what's, what's What's the definition of non-cooperation? Yeah, it, that, that's a great question. So when we think about writing survey questionnaires, we try to avoid uh, technical language to the extent possible. Uh, so in the survey experiments that I just described, this is broadly uh, a scenario where local law enforcement is working together with ICE versus where local law enforcement is not working together with ICE. Now, the generality there is, is, is purposeful for the, um, uh, for the objectives of the uh, research. Now, we know that not working together with ICE versus working together with ICE, the devil's in the details. So the data don't speak uh, specifically to what specific policies uh, should be enacted in order to sort of increase uh, trust or uh, increase civic participation. But what I will say is that when it comes to the city of New York making explicit gestures to undocumented immigrants in the city, we know from these data that 70%, so that's 69.9%, are less likely to engage public institutions, for example, City Hall, if they are required to give their personal contact information in that scenario where local law enforcement is working together with ICE. Now, anything that the city of New York does, uh, again, and you know, explicitly as a matter of policy, is going to speak to this finding in particular, because what this means is that the city is going to be communicating to undocumented immigrants that, yes, they can come to the city, that they, they can trust the city's institutions uh, to get information or help if they need it. And whether it's a 70 percent effect or, or, or what the true effect is, I can't speak to. But the general scenario of local law enforcement working together with ICE versus not working together with ICE even in that general scenario, we're getting these significantly large treatment effects. And so if you sort of think about what undocumented immigrants are, are worried about in particular, which is, you know, for example, being uh, apprehended at a courtroom um, or filling out a public form and having that sent to ICE uh, leading to a, an enforcement action, then those types of things are going to be what comprises this, for example, 70 percent effect um, in terms of the use of public services. So even though I can't say specifically what policies uh, lead to these effects, we know that anything that distances the city of New York from the veneer of working together with ICE is going to drive some of these results. Uh, thank you, Professor Wong, and and I think you know moving away from uh, the questions about the data, uh, we're open to hearing anything you'd like to say about envisioning this humane immigration enforcement agency as someone who studies the relationship between NYPD or a, a local police force and ICE, 
and how this kind of fits into the larger conversation about abolishing ICE. I, I, I don't know if in your capacity you want to comment on that, but I want to give you the opportunity to do that if you would like to. Yeah, I, and, and maybe this territory has already been tread um, in the hearing so far, but I think in the ongoing research that I'm doing with undocumented immigrants, it's clear that undocumented immigrants want safe communities. They want to engage, uh, be engaged in their communities and with their neighbors and with the public institutions that surround them. There aren't undocumented immigrants that we've come across in our, 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 our surveys that say, yes, we want, um, for example, murderers to live in our communities. And so what what that speaks to to me is one part of the debate that seems to be missing, which is if there are immigration enforcement efforts that, for example, are focusing on, and the catchphrase back during the uh, Obama years was felons, not families, then ICE would actually end uh, law enforcement efforts more generally targeted at, um, for example, those felons, not families, would actually receive more support from undocumented communities um, than, than, than not. And so when we think about re-envisioning from abolish ICE or sort of, you know, reimagining what immigration enforcement looks like in the United States, it's not an either or in terms of getting cooperation among undocumented communities. It's finding the right balance where hardworking undocumented immigrants without criminal records can live their lives while not sort of being in fear that living their lives would lead to detention and deportation. In those scenarios, if we have smart immigration enforcement that is able to distinguish between individuals with no criminal records who are just going about their lives uh, versus others, then I think we would actually get more uh, cooperation and participation among undocumented communities themselves. Uh, for the simple reason that nobody wants their families to grow up in communities that are not safe. And undocumented immigrants have a role in keeping our communities safe, but they can't fulfill that role or fully realize that role if in doing so that risks their ability to live in the country. So smart enforcement um, is not an either or when it comes to uh, enlisting the support of undocumented communities. Thank you, Professor Wong, for joining us from California uh, in San Diego. I, I don't know what the weather is out there, but it's uh, it's a scorcher here. And thank you so much for bringing so much, uh, so much not only data, but uh, the kind of academic, uh, the kind of academic responsibility and duty in this conversation to share with us here at this institution, the largest council in the country, the first of its kind uh, hearing that will hopefully have ripples across the country. Thank you so much for the work that you do um, uh, and for the research that you are connected to. We're looking forward to working with you on, on, this, on this question and other questions for, on immigration in the future. Thank you all for your leadership and the weather is always great in San Diego. <laughs> no oh, San Diego, California. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, thank you, bye. Now we are transitioning to our next panel, and we have uh, Lindsay Nash from the Immigration Justice Clinic, who will join us over here, please. And then as you get settled down, uh, settled in, I should say, we have five, four other and final panel, uh, Jake, Rob, uh, Khalil, and Fabiola. Uh, you're all still here, right? Okay, most of you I think are still here. Great, thank you so much, and you'll be in the next panel, and next and final panel. And if you, do, if you are, if, you did, if, you did, if I did not call your name, and want to testify, please get a witness slip so we can get you on to the next panel as well. Please, thank you. Make sure that the, the, red, the light is red. There we go. 
So, you know, for the vast majority of people in America today, I, I think the concept of the immigration enforcement system seems synonymous with ICE and with ICE's really brutal tactics. Um, but this hasn't, this doesn't have to be what our immigration system looks like. For a lot of our history, in fact, it wasn't. These, these tactics and this sort of, the mechanisms that it uses to arrest people in our communities are relatively recent phenomenon. So ICE was born out of a, a wave of national security uh, hysteria, fear, and really a lot of xenophobia at the time. But before that, the immigration system was set up a little bit differently. It wasn't always perfect, it wasn't always humane, but it did have some different goals and values. Immigrant services like naturalization and humanitarian programs were housed in the same agency subcomponent as enforcement. And so this meant that the agency self-identified as having a number of different missions, many of which related to actually serving immigrant communities. This changed in the wake of 9-11 when a fear of terrorism began to really grip our country in a new way. And so border security and immigration became increasingly, and became increasingly associated with national security. And these concerns led to the creation of ICE in 2003. So in creating ICE, co Congress isolated the harshest functions in our immigration system, that is apprehension, enforcement, detention, and deportation, and allowed that agenda to define ICE as a whole. ICE has since grown into a massive police force with its sister entity, CBP. It's the largest police force in the nation. And over the past decade in particular, ICE has expanded its reach by inserting itself into state and local systems using state and local resources to try to enforce within communities. Where communities have resisted, ICE has hit back, ripping immigrant families out of their homes in home raids, staking them out at courthouses, and ambushing them at interviews. To put it succinctly, the experiment that ICE was has failed. We have an agency that's purely focused on enforcement with far too much money and far too much power and far too little oversight. And for our communities, the result really has been disastrous. So we need to return to an immigration system that views its mission holistically, one that sees protection of asylum seekers and the inclusion of immigrants as part of its role. Only once that you have an agency that recognizes the importance of those things and our humanitarian obligations on a global scale can we start to think about what fair and just enforcement might look like. So given that history and where we are now, I really applaud the city council for moving forward to think about what a humane immigration system might look like. Thank you. And one of the, uh, one of the things that you, you kind of present here in the kind of historical understanding about the holistic approach to an agency that is not siloed into enforcement only and therefore you get trained to do enforcement without the other components of immigration like the benefits uh, is is that you lose that so just tell us a little bit more about because part of this hearing is to kind of take all the data including the fears and I think some even some members mm -hmm. are, are kind of connecting to the sense of fear that 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 if we don't have a mechanism that's going to take care of the bad guys that that what 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 is what is that? What what? Is, why is that helpful? How is that helpful? And when we when we can, all we have to do is kind of go back to a time when when I think you're referring to INS. Mm -hmm. The same people kind of did everything, and so tell us a little bit about any data that you might be pointing to that kind of shows how enforcement in that time looked as opposed to now, as this experiment what we're calling failed, uh, continues. Well, I think one of the things we can say is that we're seeing, you know, that some people are concerned about the need to be able to continue to have enforcement against people who they think maybe should be deported. But I think part of the problem with that is right now we're deporting many, many people who don't even fit within that description within what I think those people would consider to be bad guys or the people who should be deported. And I, so I think one way in which, or one check against that in the past was different types of prosecutorial discretion that the agency had, for example, that it used to not deport the kind of people with 
that I think even people who think there should be enforcement would want to deport. There was, um, that's not to say that there wasn't enforcement done, but there was an actual, in many instances, so that they could actually look at, at a person's history or what a person was contributing and make different enforcement decisions. Right now, it's a much harder lined, rigid approach. And so the kind of enforcement that we're seeing doesn't necessarily align with the concerns of people who think what we really need is to be able to deport certain categories of people. And without ICE, do you believe that there would be enforcement? I mean, literally, if tomorrow ICE just kind of disappeared as a city agency, would the system itself as a federal uh, kind of public safety system, maybe it's Homeland Security, if that doesn't change, um, would be able to kind of address those, those kind of the need for criminal enforcement already, uh, or, or the criminal enforcement that is in need? I mean, I think I do think that there would be a way to do criminal enforcement. I mean, ICE, ICE does large amount of civil enforcement, and so I think criminal enfor enforcement would still be able to be done by the agencies that do that through the criminal enforcement systems, through criminal courts. I mean, we have them set up to function and to sort of decide if somebody has committed a crime and to deal with an appropriate punishment. And increasingly, we've tied immigration consequences to uh, criminal convictions, and so the, crim the immigration consequences impose an additional penalty, but that's not what's necessary for the criminal justice system to function. Got it. And, and maybe the last, the, the last question here is, is really connecting the concept of enforcement and understanding that more in a world where we have no more ICE, that it, we, we can't have a, a fuller, the, the fuller question includes the the, the immigration system reform that we've been asking for for a long time and, and access and pathways for citizenship for productive members of our community uh, that, that could be afforded benefits that are no longer afforded benefits because of the lack of reform mm -hmm. that we can't just get done in Congress. And so I maybe just want to maybe ask you to kind of make that connection if, that, if there is one between the enforcement and then the general immigration system itself offering benefits and pathways to citizenship and benefits in general? Yeah, I mean, I think what we've seen over the years time and again is where um, the agency does something that offers benefits in some way. Uh, one of the trade-offs is to ramp up enforcement against certain categories of people. You saw that even under Obama, and so while um, you know, there is a ratcheting effect where if they just keep increasing enforcement and increasing benefits a little bit and taking them away, what's gonna happen is that the enforcement is just gonna go up and up and up. Um, but I think that politically, there probably does have to be some give with respect to enforcement um, if you want to move forward with immigration reform that benefits communities. But I think something that's really key there then is to have the affected communities be involved in figuring out what what that deal would look like and what, what trade-offs and enforcement would be acceptable to them in order to get the benefits. And I think that there's a lot of different views within communities about whether, whether we should agree to increased enforcement in order to get benefits. Well, if there's any more data uh, or thinking Cardozo Law or anywhere else that you think might be helpful for us, we're going to be uh, we're we're going to keep this open in discussion as we as we analyze data and information, ideas, uh, reform reform for the immigration system as we think about abolishing ICE on the enforcement side. Um, but thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for thinking this through. Thank you. Uh, we're going to call our final panel. Uh, Fabiola Mendieta, if you can come to the to the the dais, and then Khalil Cumberbatch, please, from the Fortune Society. Uh, Rob Solano, if you're in the room, from Churches United for Fair Housing. Uh, Jake LaRouse, as well. Is there anybody else that I haven't called that wants to testify today? Okay. Thank you.
Mendieta, can you please begin? Good afternoon to Good afternoon. everyone. Uh, I just want to thank you for letting me speak today. Um, I'm here today because I'm an immigrant myself. I came to this country 17 years ago. Um, in my hometown, unfortunately, when you were a woman, and when you try to claim your right to speak, and especially when you come from an indigenous mother, it's very difficult, and especially when you, they know that you're very smart and you wanna spread the word that every woman have a right. The government come after you. So I came to the States when I was 17 year old. Um, what I wanna say today is abolish eyes for us is very important because we see the fear in the community. I don't know if you remember early this year, to be exactly April 11th, there was a huge riot. I received a phone call from one of the members in the community and her wife was, um, I want to I say one of the oldest daughters, the, the words, what she said. I was sleeping and woke, up, and woke up because someone was banging on the door very hard. So I went to my parents' bedroom to tell them. My dad opened the front door a little bit and they say that they were looking for a woman and show us a picture, it was a dark woman, it was not my mother. The errands arrived at the family's apartment in Bushwick at 6.40 a.m. Well, everyone was still sleeping. The first say they were police then they say they were detectives. Once they were inside, they say they, they were eyes and they were looking for my mom. When I think what happened on April 11, I cry every single day. I'm suffering from panic attacks. My mom is out of detention now, but she's in high risk. I, I'm thinking if any, any time that she go to a police department, something happened to us, they will cut eyes on her. I'm afraid that she's gonna go to one of the appointments and they gonna tell her that she have to go back home. It's just one of them in the community, but there is many, many more. We also have another, another woman, her name is Elvia. She have two kids, and the kids have witnesses how the father have um, been trapped by the eyes. It was the same day at the same time. Hmm. It was April 11, at 6.40 a.m. Eyes is when our community heard the word eyes, they're very panicky. They've been traumatized. And it's also been blocking the, um, the friendship that we try to have with the police department, with NYPD. And I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of you know about the little girl that was killed in Bushwick on June 24th. And the mom was intimidated one, one of the police officers. So today, I'm here to tell their stories, but like I said, it's only a few of them, and there's many more in the community, in our broken community, and there are moms, there are women, the indigenous women too, and thank you for letting me, let me be here today. Thank you for your testimony, for your own story and the stories that you brought here today, every story deserves to be lifted up and be heard, uh, and that's what affords us that opportunity in this space uh, to have your time and moment to talk to us as the policymakers of the city. We not only make laws, we adopt a budget uh, to support the needs of our community, and every New Yorker's need needs to be heard and understood, and we have a duty to respond. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Hello. Thank you.
thank you, Chair and committee members, uh, for uh, having this hearing and this testimony and taking this position on an issue that is ravishing our communities. Um, as mentioned, my name is Khalil Cumberbatch. I am the Associate Vice President of Policy at a reentry organization here in New York City called the Fortune Society. Um, I did have a formal written testimony to read today, um, but after sitting in the audience for quite some time, I felt compelled to just really tell my story. Um, I have a very unique and uh, uh, story to tell about my experience in terms of immigration detention, in terms of ICE. Um, and the outcomes of my story are very exceptional, I must admit, but that's not because I myself am somehow exceptional. Uh, I am quite honestly the product of many exceptional opportunities. So uh, I am formally incarcerated. I served six and a half years in the New York State prison system for a robbery in the first degree, which is considered to be a violent felony offense. Um, and I say that not to in any way gloat about the fact that I once held a gun to someone and took their property. I share that because there has been conversation today about people who have been convicted of violent offenses and it has been hinted that somehow those people are not worthy in some respects of opportunities. Um, and I have to say that I wholeheartedly disagree. I wouldn't be sitting here if it literally wasn't for the fact that people continuously looked over the fact that I myself was once convicted of a violent felony offense and extended opportunities to me. After leaving prison in February, on February 26 of 2010, I began my reentry pretty much as most people would when they leave prison with the goal of one, not going back, and two, contributing to society in a way that was positive. I did that for four years. I worked almost uh, from the time I left prison uh, in the field of social services, working with people who were HIV and AIDS positive and then helping people get enrolled into college who were formerly incarcerated. I had successfully completed parole and uh, was raising a family, was contributing to society in ways that I had only dreamed of when sitting in a maximum security prison. On May 8th, 2014, when I was one week away from completing a master's degree, Immigration Customs Enforcement came to my home to arrest and detain me. They came very much, as my colleague here mentioned before me, um, under different, uh, 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 they came with the intention of misleading me. They rang the doorbell at seven o'clock in the morning while I was getting my daughters ready for school. My wife and I were getting ready for our day they too told me that they were um, looking for someone else. They too told me that they were New York City police detectives. And for someone who has had involvement in the criminal justice system, police standing at your door is not a welcoming sight seven o'clock in the morning, and so you comply. I let them in to our home, and, and it was in our living room that they told my wife and I the real reason that they were there, who they really were. And they continued to put me in handcuffs in front of my children, in front of my wife, in front of my neighbors, and brought me outside and put me in one of four unmarked vehicles um, and whisked me away to 26 Federal Plaza, where by the end of the day I was in a holding cell in Kearney, New Jersey, and ended up being in immigration detention for five and a half months with the sole purpose of deporting me back to my birth country of Guyana. It was only through a huge advocacy effort on my behalf that I was able to win my release from, Im from immigration detention based almost exclusively on all of the things that I had been able to do over the last four years, including being one week away from completing a master's degree. I say that because one, my story is not of someone who is undocumented. I think that we have had a large conversation about undocumented communities and the vulnerabilities that they face, and we need to have those conversations. But ICE is also impacting folks who are here documented and people who have been convicted of violent felony offenses. But undocumented or not, the fact that someone has been exposed to the criminal justice system 
while they may have once been deemed a criminal, doesn't mean that a person have, has to remain a criminal. I myself have made flawed decisions in the past that has caused harm to people, and I have taken many steps to try to right those wrongs, but again, I would not be sitting here had it not been for uh, a continued access to exceptional opportunities. So I sit here today really sharing my story to one, humanize the issue that we're talking about, the impact that ICE has on communities, both documented and not, how ICE can mislead you to believe that they are an entity that is really protecting the streets of, of major metropolitan cities, but the reality is that they're not. They're causing trauma, they're causing harm, trauma and harm that unfortunately will more than likely be generational. And one way to potentially address that is to address the many wrongs that ICE is inflicting on many communities, but particularly communities of color, and unfortunately in communities that are undocumented. So thank you for this opportunity, and I will submit my uh, formal written testimony uh, before I leave, but really just felt compelled to change course uh, because I do want to humanize the issue for us today um, by putting a face to what it is that we're really talking about. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your testimony, your story, your courage, your um, un, un, uh, undying continued sense of public service as well. I, I know your work and you continue to continue to do so much more uh, to help uh, your fellow New Yorker and beyond. So thank you for that. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, thank you, Chairman Chaka and the other members of the committee for inviting me to speak today. Uh, my name is Jake LaRosse. I am a practicing immigration attorney working primarily in the areas of deportation defense, family-based immigration, and humanitarian relief. Uh, in my personal capacity, I've also been involved in immigration-related policy development and legislative advocacy on the Hill. Uh, in both my day-to-day -day professional life and personal advocacy efforts, I've had the opportunity to bear witness to the practices and policies of the United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement and consequently have come to the unavoidable, unmistakable conclusion. ICE is broken. As a federal agency, as a law enforcement body, as a tangible real world standard bearer for American immigration law and policy, ICE has proven to be supremely and likely irreparably flawed. Since the new administration took over slightly more than a year and a half ago, ICE has repeatedly and increasingly given into its worst impulses and unapologetically shoved aside the better angels of bureaucratic prudence and good sense. In doing so, it has left a dark, indelible mark on the immigrant communities within which it operates and the country it claims to protect. At present, ICE is the tip of the spear of the Trump administration's growing war on non-citizens, documented and undocumented alike. The sound enforcement priorities implemented under President Obama were senselessly scrapped within weeks of Inauguration Day and were repla uh, replaced with priorities so broad and open-ended that they encompass every undocumented indiv individual in the United States. ICE agents now storm into schools, hospitals, courts, and houses of, wor uh, houses of worship in search of any and all non-citizens with possible or suspected problems with their legal status. The agency also serves as a willing vehicle for the president's racist and xenophobic flights of fancy, carrying out elaborate enforcement operations in our, in our own backyard to the beat of Trump's fear-mongering MS-13 drum and detaining teenagers, mere children, on dubious gang affiliation charges because they made the mistake of wearing the wrong hat or the wrong pair of sneakers in a Facebook photo. This callousness has also extended to ICE's legal arm, which contains the cadre of agency attorneys who represent the federal government during removal proceedings. Once the more civilized and level-headed side of the ICE coin, the agency's trial attorneys have now been charged with pursuing nearly all removal cases to completion and opposing virtually all efforts by respondents in immigration court or their attorneys for continuances, temporary closure of the case, or similar requests that were previously considered uh, and often granted without issue. There used to be some understanding about uh, non-citizens non in immigration court who were eligible for relief and an understanding to some degree between counsel and uh, the trial attorneys that it didn't make sense or wasn't really in furtherance of that person's rights to pursue removal fast and uh, to the end when they're eligible for relief that they are in the process of pursuing. That's no longer the case. Now uh, trial attorneys fight tooth and nail 
to try and uh, get a removal order as soon as possible, regardless of whether the person in proceedings has a pending application for special immigrant juvenile status or for a U visa, which is a visa for victims of criminal uh, activity who are worked with uh, law enforcement investigation or prosecution of the crime. Regardless of those things, they're still pursuing, and those evidence relief, they're still pursuing removal to all ends. In my practice as an, as an immigration attorney, these are all developments I've witnessed over the last year and a half. From surprise detentions at visa interviews, to unreasonable intransigence in immigration court, to aggressive pushback at deportation reporting appointments, the fish rots from the head. The President, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Director of ICE. But the sickness extends throughout to all parts of the agency. Just this week, one of my colleagues uh, was threatened with involuntary removal from the Enforcement Removal Operations Office by an ICE officer. Uh, because they claimed she was impeding the lawful detention of a, uh, our client because she was merely asking why it was happening. In another incident that's happened uh, relatively recently, another colleague was fighting fairly, uh, fairly vociferously against uh, or arguing against uh, our client's detention at another reporting appointment uh, to which uh, the officer who was uh, detaining our client replied dismissively, it's a new administration, get used to it. And so, as the calls for abolishing ICE began to move to the fore in recent months, I began to ask myself how I felt about this immigration cause. While reform and oversight by Congress or the executive branch might have been sufficient revenues in times past, we do not now live in such mundane times. Faced with this futility, there's only one rational alternative, abolishing ICE, or more specifically, to seal a phrase from the Republicans, repeal and replace. It is now hard to deny that we have reached the point of no return for this agency. Uh, from a toxic agency culture, which one veteran ICE agent told the New Yorker amounts to, quote, contempt that I've never seen so rampant towards the aliens, end quote, to use of the agency's bully pulpit to intentionally lie to the public, to the abuses previously outlined, the conduct and candor of ICE very much seems to be baked into the fabric of the 15-year-old agency. Just as support for abolishing ICE is animated by both policy concerns and communal values, so too are local measures seeking the limitation or prescription of municipal cooperation with the agency motivated by these same forces. When ICE officers are invading sensitive locations throughout our, hist throughout our city, bullying non-citizens and citizens alike, injecting a visceral fear into the community with their haphazard, undiscerning enforcement efforts, it is reasonable to expect local elected officials to stand up for their constituents, their neighbors, their friends. It is an act of both political responsibility and personal courage to stand up for one's fellow New Yorkers in such a manner and impose a cost in response to damaging agency behavior. This is thus the, pa this is thus the path forward for us. As Slate Jamel Bowie put it, to have, quote, an honest discussion about whether ICE can be effectively reformed or if it must be abolished and replaced by an agency that can carry out its mission in a more effective and humane way, end quote. Based on my professional experiences as an immigration attorney and the documented actions of the agency over the last year and a half, I find myself unavoidably supporting the latter. Last year, then ICE Acting Director Thomas Homan told Congress that undocumented immigrants, quote, should be uncomfortable in looking over their shoulders. More than a year later, I sincerely hope that ICE's leadership is uncomfortable looking, uncomfortably looking over its own shoulder as political accountability is on the horizon and moving ever closer. Thank you uh, for that testimony and, and your personal work that you do every day to defend our, our immigrant brothers and sisters. And, and, and it makes me think about uh, just asking all of you, a lot of what we did today was, was kind of think about this question in terms of and in different perspectives, from academics to the city agencies to all of you on the ground that have your personal stories and your personal work that you do every day to defend and really call out for a better system, a humane and just system. And, and I think as New Yorkers, uh, do you believe that the city of New York is, is, is messaging, is demonstrating its commitment to a sanctuary city that the data shows when there is limited or no cooperation with ICE is a better place for public safety. Do you as New Yorkers feel like this is a better place for, for public safety that you can engage in in your communities? And as New Yorkers, I'd like your perspective on, on that. How are we doing yeah. <laughs> as a city of New York? I think that I think that there are communities that feel 
safe based on well let me ask this question when do you feel the most safest in this city I mean most people don't feel safe in Penn Station hmm. when you see heavy militarized p firearms fully loaded automatic weapons military personnel and not to say that we don't have history in this city understanding why that is undoubtedly necessary, but it does not evoke the feeling of safety. Quite literally, when I'm in Penn Station, I want to get out as quickly as possible. Most people feel the safest when they're in a park or when they see children playing or when they hear music that they like. Mm. Most people do not feel safe with an understanding that even if you go to court to respond to a summons or if you go to court to make a complaint that you could potentially be snatched, no one, I don't think people would feel safe if they are dropping their children off to school. One of the most important moments for a parent-child relationship that they feel safe because they know that ICE could potentially snatch them from there I think New York City is doing the best that it can in terms of trying to message to people that the city is taking steps to protect them. But the reality is that ICE is operating in a way that is unaccountable from, federal, from, from any federal oversight. And therefore, that translates to people as terrorism in many respects. Um, I think that there are people in communities that are leaving their homes every day with contingency plans in case one of them don't come home. That in and of itself is enough to speak to how some communities feel as it relates to immigration customs enforcement. Like I said before, right? I, I can, when they say eyes, I have in my own experience. Um, I live in Connecticut for kind of a while, and I live with a person who was abusing me in every several ways. And I was afraid to call the police and him, just thinking in my head that they can put me into ice hands and then send me back home, which is not any safer. And I've seen the community a lot of fear Usually it's men that they, they've been um, get apprehended by ICE, but lately it's just anyone. Mothers of a family, fathers, and like he said, um, we don't feel safe in a lot of ways. Uh, I would just want to add, I think, focusing on messaging, as you do, I think is important, and I think in this context, one thing we really want to keep in mind when we think about ICE's function and we think about HSI and we think about enforcement, the way we try and justify their actions by talking about alleged criminality. Um, one of the councilmen earlier uh, talked about the good things ICE does and uh, its removal numbers in fiscal year 2017 of criminals. Uh, I haven't looked at those I don't have those numbers offhand, but I've looked at the uh, statistics generally. And the thing is, your definition of criminal and my definition of criminal could be different, but it's a very big catch-all. And that means that people who ICE allowed as being part of the quote-unquote criminal aliens who we've removed, they're, you know, it's certainly going to include people with very serious crimes, but it's also going to include people with a 15-year-old DUI, an old uh, possession charge someone who pled guilty to disorderly conduct. Under the law, they're considered criminal aliens. That doesn't mean they're dangerous to our uh, community or they're uh, threats to public safety. Usually, more often than not, it's someone who made a mistake and now is working, is paying their taxes, is uh, just living their life like any other New Yorker. And so, and yet they are lumped in as a criminal alien and used to justify ISIS actions when that act of picking this person up and ripping them out of the community where they're contributing 
is part of the problem, that they're not discerning between actual threats to public safety, actual serious criminal risks, or national security risks, and people who, you know, their record doesn't actually reflect their current situation and doesn't reflect their current participation in the community. Um, yeah. I want to thank the, the pan this panel and uh, the members of the committee who are here today, the members of the press, uh, really everyone that made this uh, hearing possible. Um, what it did is what it, we do here in the City Council is really be thoughtful and ensure that every voice that wants to be heard is heard so that we can be most informed as we move forward in policy recommendations, uh, both the ones that we can impact and the ones that we can't have the power to because we're not the federal government here, um, but we still have a voice and this is still our government. And the question before us came, and I, I, and I just can't say this enough, through investigative reporting uh, and through a constituent that sent us the link to this reporting about ICE uh, and contracts with cities and really prompted us to make a, a uh, commitment to understand what that relationship is because any relationship with an agency that has caused so much terror in our hearts and our minds uh, needs to be examined. And that's what we're doing here. We are examining it. Um, because at the end of the day, one of the core concepts that came up from all sides of the discussion was this concept of public safety. How do we feel safe in our neighborhoods? But not just the feeling of safe as a, as a passive New Yorker walking through the streets, but as an active member of our society, both being able to act upon a sense of wanting to help make the world safer and better for the world, but also for ourselves. If we are if we are survivors of domestic violence, how do we initiate the possibility of a better life? Or we're sick and ill and need to go to the doctor and get health care or legal representation and make our lives better because we have a benefit that is waiting for us that we had no idea was there. We are possibly citizens of this country, but for a lawyer not being present, we, won't, we wouldn't even know that. Those are all the things that allow us to think about what system, a humane system, could allow us to have that uh, in our lives as individuals and as a society. Um, the history that we learned today about ICE being once a holistic, a, a holistic agency can help us define the future of that agency, which is now siloed and forced, uh, and forced to focus on enforcement. Uh, not only that, but given permission from Sessions and others to think about enforcement in, in places like schools and courts because it's easier to go get those people, to go to places that justice is trying to happen and now no longer feeling safe for people to go get justice there. Um, but we do know that crime goes down when we remove our cooperation as local municipalities. The data is there. We do know that people are more safe and feel good about interacting with the civic fabric of a municipal government. We see it in our neighborhoods, but the data is there. But we still have to answer the questions that some of the fear that came out of this panel and, the, and or I should say the members of this, of, this, of this committee and this council is still there. That all of a sudden, if we abolish ICE, we're gonna have chaos. And we have to answer that question, we have to. That's something that I think is important, not just for the sake of the conversation, but the sake of how we do our work here at the council, a democratic process, a, a full understanding, a thoughtful response. And so I do believe though that the experiment has failed, as was said earlier, that it's time to abolish ICE, that it's time to remove this agency and bring a more thoughtful, humane system forward that includes an immigration reform uh, system, not just the enforcement side, but the benefit side for pathways for citizenship um, because that's what we deserve as Americans and future Americans. And so 1092 is the opportunity for us to move forward and say no. Uh, even though there are only two contracts here uh, that are less than $200,000, that it's not about the money that we're going to be losing in the revenue. We cannot buy trust. Trust is born out of a, few, a, a real sense of cooperation that we cannot put a price on. And that is at what is at stake for the purpose of safety, public safety in our neighborhoods and across this country. And so I'm hoping that this hearing continues and we're calling upon not just the state here in this 
uh, beautiful state of New York, but across the country that municipalities and state legislative bodies create immigration committees to have these discussions with people and allowing voices to come out and stories to be told and fears to be out and open to be calmed and to be educated so that we can move together. Uh, and that's the power of what the, we do here in the council and what we did today. So thank you so much for everybody's work on this. Uh, we're gonna wanna invite you back for more discussions. We have a busy next few months uh, and, and hearings, um, but I hope this really moves forward and uh, in a productive, thoughtful way. Thank you so much for your, for your time. And now we're gonna adjourn uh, this hearing and have a uh, vote next week, I believe, we'll Wednesday the 12th. Uh, at 10 a.m. and we'll be voting on this resolution uh, and any other business before the council on this immigration here uh, committee thank you so much